Well, well, well. <laughs> Max Verstappen goes out and dominates the Spanish Grand Prix with a Grand Slam victory. It was a perfect win from pole position, fastest lap of the race, led every single lap on track. It was a flawless performance, but hey, there's some surprises to get through as well. Uh, we got Mercedes, Aston Martin and Ferrari all over the place, Alpine getting involved as well. We got, we got to break it all down over here on the WTF1 Wrap, powered by MoneyGram. I am your host, Dre Harrison. Thank you very much for joining us after the Spanish Grand Prix, and I have an incredibly special guest. Um, I am very, very honoured to be able to share this space with former F1 driver, former Formula E driver, and now fantastic DJ as well, Jaime Algaswari. Hello, Jaime. How, how are you doing, sir? Hi. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. All good. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm great. I'm just, just delighted. To, I, I, it's not every day I get to sit down with a former F1 driver. I, I am a little bit starstruck myself. But uh, I, I'm a normal human, human being. I did my best when I had the, the chance to, to do it and, and with, the, you know, with the tools I had. So we are normal <laughs> people, just like to drive fast, fast cars. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a small difference, but it's a tangible it's a one. But uh, but um, yeah, so so Jaime, were, were you on Spanish TV today? Is that you coming from from TV studio right now, basically? Yeah, I'm in Madrid. I live in Barcelona, mm. and I really did the the Spanish. Uh, the, we broadcasted the Spanish uh, GP mm -hmm. Prix for uh, the public national television, which is Telecinco, who won the rights for this race, only oh, for yeah. this race. Okay. We have incredible audiences, of course, because we have two drivers with competitive cars. Nevertheless, the race today was not a very good one for us, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we had good, good, good audience. Like I think all overall, like three million people. Oh wow, so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, big numbers. So it's good. It means Formula One is growing up in Spain. It's Formula One is a big business, and it's good for everyone. I mean, it's part like the the. the Sport is, is growing up in general, and and it's great for uh, everyone involved. So yeah, happy happy for these numbers. Yeah. Uh, before yeah, before we get into the Spanish GP itself, I mean, a couple of questions I want to ask you and, and pick your brains over, especially given that obviously you've riv you've obviously driven an F one yourself. Um, first of all, what did you make of the chicane um, going away? We've gone back to the old layout, first time since 2006. Um, we've raced with the old layout, with the fast sweeping uh, end of the lap, turns 12 and 13 at the end. Um, did you ever get to drive around there, even in testing with that layout? Or was it a chicane that no. we ever knew? And do, do, do you no, like we it never, more? We, <laughs> never knew, we never did the, the old area, let's say, because mm. that was used to be the old and the original uh part of the track however to be honest nothing changes a good car is always a good car on slow speed <laughs> and has corners uh red bull dominates because they have much more efficient downforce than the rest of the cars so no matter which layout you choose they're gonna win anyway and anywhere and anyway so if i have to choose of course i prefer high speed corners it's nicer mm. uh it's a bit more difficult for the neck like physical condition mm. uh, but at the end of the day you know um, it's a little bit more easy for the tires as well because you know you have this combined area on traction which you use much more the tires. So honestly, I'm not sure if it was a good point to do it. But um, yeah, it gives more. It gives more speed. It gives more energy on the drivers and so on. But I I, I don't know why they took it out. Like they removed it for the like in, 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 for the first time, you know. And mm. now they took it back, you know. I find, sure. yeah, I find it funny because I think I think I remember back then they said that they were going to do it to try and improve overtaking in that area, and yet we actually had quite a few overtakes during this race today. Because I, I mean, I think what was quite interesting was the fact that we had you know a lot of variance on strategy and what tires to put on in the early going, and you had a lot of guys on different tires, different pace. I think it I think it slowed down a bit in the second half of the race, but in the first half I actually thought it was quite decent to see a bunch of cars swapping around different game plans, different strategies coming into play. I mean, what did you make of it on your end? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think Mercedes were really surprised on the race pace. Absolutely. Um, I think they didn't really really ex expect to go that quick, especially on the medium compound. I think the medium compound today worked really well. The medium and the hard compound worked better than expected. It wasn't mm. all as low as low tire, and it lasted for very long, around 25, 30, uh, 
They kept really consistent and good lap times. I think the soft tires didn't work as anyone expected. Mm. You could see, like the guys who switched to mediums, they had a better strategy and a more efficient race in general. Um, track evolution was massive. Of course, we were coming from a very difficult qualifying yesterday with the rain being part of it. Uh, so the track was just getting more grip as the session was uh, evolving. And we saw it at the start of the race today. Like uh, there was a huge track evolution from the beginning till the end. And uh, just the tires were degrading less and it was easier to drive. So, yeah, I mean, you've you've been there as well obviously in, in i know the v8 era was a bit was a bit more uh downforce heavy and maybe not quite as powerful as uh these f1 cars we've got now but i know you mentioned how difficult qualifying was and the fact that it was so, the, the conditions were so changeable we did get a bit of rain um and a damp track to go into the start of qualifying and certain cars and drivers charles leclerc i'm looking at you struggled a lot more with that um compared to others i mean what is it like behind the wheel driving in those sorts of conditions where you know it's maybe not quite you know it's it's not quite wet enough for the intermediate and yet you know it's hard to, to say when this when it's worth running dry so how did you know when it was time to switch and what was it like behind the wheel for you yeah well you know when when these circumstances comes to you and you have like a track where it's not clearly for rain or intermediate and it's on slick mm. track because it's tricky uh it's great when you don't have a competitive car <laughs> you actually you, know, you 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 can actually get things a bit more neutral for everyone mm. and driver abilities i guess are a bit more important than just in a normal predictable slick uh dry condition so i had a lot of fun when these days were coming in and especially when the rain was coming in because normally we were much quicker than on the dry mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was a difficult qualifying session, especially not just on the conditions of the track, especially because of the ability to understand the working ranges of the tires. I did a lot of um, development for Pirelli. Oh, and yeah. These tires, any tires have a specific working range of temperature. They have, you have to get the tires to work on this temperature. If you don't get the tires to work on this uh, window, uh, you don't have you won't have the grip the tire won't give you the uh, ability of giving you the extra grip that the tire can have mm. and can hold so you're gonna be nowhere so if you don't manage to get the tires to work in this working range and different compounds and different tire structures have different working ranges mm. of temperature so you have to understand very well where you need to be on those temps and this is what we've seen yesterday this is what we've seen you know hulkenberg out qualifying his teammate by six, seven tenths and being in Q3 with a Haas car mm. because they understood really well the working ranges of the tires. We've seen the same with Leclerc and with Perez, you know, like Max having so much grip and being, you know, he could have done at least more than seven tenths faster than P2 mm. qualifying. And Perez was absolutely nowhere because he just didn't have this window, uh, this working range. Sainz did another great job understanding the working range of the tires. So really, honestly, guys, you have to understand how these tires work. And it's not an easy job. It's not about being quick. It's not about being the fastest and the most talented driver in the world. It's about being smart, understanding very well what's happening in your car and with your setup, how you drive these tires in on the warm-up lap, on the out lap, um, and getting to work very, very hard when you take your helmet off. It's all about that. You know, you have to mm. be smart. Formula One is not just about putting the throttle and... <laughs> trying to go as quick as you can through the corner. Never, never. There's always a lot more to it than that. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I was wanted to get an F1 driver's insight into it. I do find these sorts of discussions fascinating, seeing what it's like, especially because it's, it's easy for us to sit here and comment and say that, uh, you know, well, one, one tire is better than the other. And, you know, it's, you know, what getting the conditions and getting the transition point wrong but uh always find it fascinating to see how other drivers look at it right let's get into the tier list itself i'm going to pull this up now on our screen here you can see it at home um it's the it's the, it's the tier list i always love that uh, whenever i pull this up as well a lot of people in the comments i'll, I'll always get drawn in by the thumbnail i do think it's quite funny um Right, so we're going to go driver by driver across the grid, and then we're going to score their performance over the course of the race itself. Obviously, the best the best guys will be in the S and the A tiers, all the way down to B, C, and D for the drivers that weren't so good on the day. 
Um, so yeah, we'll absolutely get into that now. Um, so let's start. I, I know a lot of guys in the, in the chat, and again, f guys in the chat on YouTube, feel free to chip in. Um, I'm fascinated to uh, to hear you guys and see what you guys' perspective is on it as well. So do let us know in the chat. Yuki Sonoda. This one's come up a lot because I think a lot of people um, saw his penalty was controversial for uh, uh, for his overtake on Joe Guan Yu, uh, Jaime. Did you think that was a penalty? Because he got he got five seconds for it um, for a um, for, for a uh, causing a collision. Also, it was, it was actually it was for you know running another driver off the track and gaining an advantage. Um, did no. you think that was a time penalty? I don't agree with the penalty because that's. For me, a normal racing movement. Uh, he was in the inside line. He was in front of Zhou at every single point. So mm. uh, it's not a question of leaning space or not. It's like a question like when you're in the racing line, you command. Yeah. This is racing. It's motorsport. Motorsport is a is a contact sport. Like if we start saying like, oh, he pushed me off the track because this and that, guys, like they didn't have time for this in the nineties. You know, really? You're in the outside, you try to do something on the outside, you're going to end up losing. Because that's the risk of going on the outside zone. So shut up and cope with it. You know, it's <laughs> water sport. So honestly, um, this is sad. Like, you cannot penalty a driver for driving and doing, behaving as a motorsport uh, proper driver. You know, you are in the racing line, you're in the inside, you're the, you are the owner of your own direction. Mm. So guy who is on the outside has everything to lose because he's on the outside, especially when you're not in the front. I mean, we're talking about different positions. You know, if, if mm. Zhu was clearly in the front on the outside, then that's another point. Yeah. But it was never the case. So really, FIA, I'm sorry, but no. Yeah. no. yeah. See, the thing is, right, I was going to say, I see, like, I personally think that the problem I have with this is it's not so much you know whether you think this is a this is a penalty or not. I personally think the stewards have not been consistent in enforcing this type of penalty. I think sometimes, I think most of the time actually, I would argue, you get away with that now in Formula One. You can you can own the line and and if the if the other guy is you know on the outside, and that's the risk you take, and they have to back out of it. If they choose to back out of it and they don't come off the racing line or they go off track or something along those lines. Generally I mean, speaking, I, I think they let it go now more often than not. You know, the, the, the crucial thing about it, for many people that have joined motorsport or spectators that don't know much about motorsport and have joined a few years ago or mm. through Netflix, TV show whatsoever, guys, we've been racing since go-karts. Mm. <laughs> go-karts <laughs> are rules when you start racing. And we've been told always try and go on the inside because when you have the grip, when you are on the racing line, you command. Oh, yeah. You're the owner of the road. So if someone is trying to do something on the outside, on the outside zone, is he at his own risk? But he, he knows he has everything to lose because you are the owner of the racing line. Sure. So the racing line is the racing line you command. So it's not a question of pushing him out. It's a question of understanding that it's not your space to be. So it's fair enough, you know, it's very um, important that everyone understands that when we start go-karting uh, go as kids, we've been told that through many years, you know, mm. try, and go, uh, try and go on the inside, the racing line. So bearing that in mind, I mean, it was a heavy penalty. It was a, it was a very costly five seconds. I think Shinoda was running eighth. It ended up dropping him down to 12th after the penalty. With that in mind... If we give him the benefit of the doubt and say he probably shouldn't have gotten that penalty, I think A tier is actually fair for you because I think he was driving a very good race until that point. Doing a good job. I think he's getting the maximum out of the car. He has experience now with the team. He's understanding really well the tyres. And honestly, it's surprising. Like, uh, he showed improvement. And this is what Red Bull wants to see on a junior driver, you absolutely. know? Absolutely. Like, you would know. <laughs> progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, when when you don't see progress on a driver and you see you know just stuck, this is no good news in Red Bull. <laughs> uh, and and Sunoda is, is just improving his performance every time, and I think it's it's great for him and for the team. He's commanding the team. He's leading the team. 
Absolutely. I think he, he has absolutely stepped up after Pierre Gasly has left and gone on to better things with Alpine. And and I think he has absolutely become the leader of that team. And I think he's been consistent and I think he's been very good all season. And I think this was another really good race from him. I, I don't think that was a penalty. I think that was a very harsh penalty. Um, and I think he should have had eighth, maybe ninth at worst. And even, even if it was ninth, that's, that's a very good day for Alpha Tauri to get in the points again. Um, so yeah, I've got Sonoda as an A. Should we get Verstappen out of the way and just put him in S from now? I think that's a very quick one. Um, we don't need to worry about that one. Grand Slam victory for Max Verstappen. That was a, 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 um, a, a incredible win for him. His 40th win in F1. It's, it's terrifying. 40 wins. He's only 25 years of age. He's, he's doing an incredible job um, at the moment. And yeah, absolutely um, dominant display from him. I want your opinion, Jaime, on, on Checo. Because I mean, it wasn't a particularly good qualifying. Was knocked out in Q2, came back up through the field, eventually finished in fourth. Didn't have the pace to chase down Russell um, in in the fight for a podium finish. But what did you make of uh, Checo's comeback from uh, from what was it P11 to uh, to P4 in the end? Ah, it's not good enough. Mm. Not good enough. You have to win with this car. <laughs> yeah. number one you don't get much chances to win when you have a good a competitive car you have to use it and take it and this is what they showed me at least you know mm. i never had a good car but uh, i did my my best with what i had uh, when you have 200 points of downforce more and you can do things that others can't oh yeah you have you have to prove it you know and you have to uh drive at your maximum and check he's not understanding the car he's a struggling um mm. You cannot be seven tenths slower than your teammate. I mean, there's something wrong here. Uh, you have to be worried. Yeah, I would. I, I would be. It's. I mean, I know the school in Red Bull and you know Helmut and the guys. They are definitely not happy at all. I don't know if they wanna if they want to find someone who is uh, reaching max pace. Maybe there's nobody like maybe Hamilton, Fernando can get closer to to. To Max, it's not an easy job to be Max uh, mm. teammate, of course. But if I would be Max teammate and I'm, you know, st I'm ending up the race 35 seconds away of him, yeah, and uh, being consistently half a second, six, seven tenths slower than him, this is a big problem. It is a big even, problem, yeah. Even if it's Max Verstappen, you know, it's a big problem. Oh yeah, absolutely. And definitely, yeah. you should definitely be very disappointed. Big mistakes in qualifying twice. Mm. The rookie mistakes, like guy, you cannot like you have a winning car, take it easy. Like you're gonna do maybe it's if it's not in the first uh, lap, you're gonna do it on the second lap, warm up the tires, but you cannot do the same mistake on the same corner twice, breaking on the outside zone when you know it's it's you know it's full of of water, and that's a rookie mistake. So it's it looks like Checo is lost mm. in something in somewhere where he's not feeling comfortable with the car course and i've been there you know every every driver has at some point of his career have been in this situation and it's not nice no. but he needs to step up the game definitely yeah I, I i mean he was only i think what was it eight points back after baku he's now 50 plus he's two races behind now it's it's like it's, it's looking... so much better than the rest mm. like max was driving qualifying with one hand yeah he didn't use the last set of tires because he didn't need to didn't need to yeah, you know, he would have been, he would have done an 11, 8, 11, 7, 11, 8 would have he would have been his ideal lap time, and he was going to do it because he was he he did uh, uh, purple sector two, and then backed off because there was no need to push it. But um, you could see his qualifying lap, Max was not even using the full uh, the, um, meters of the track. He was not mm. using the full length of the of the track. He was just. Easy driving, uh, you know, on his uh, rhythm pace, but comfortably driving. Yeah. So this means that he's he's just controlling the whole thing in in the team. Absolutely. And his teammate is nowhere like that. Oh, definitely. It, it, it is a big problem. And yeah, Perez looks a little bit lost out there again. There was a, there was some hope for a title fight out of these two, but last two races on con more conventional tracks, Perez has definitely struggled. I'm having him in C tier on this one. The damage was done yesterday. He, I mean, it was yeah. okay to come back to, to, to fourth today, but that's not where Perez wants or needs to be, uh, in my opinion. Are we going to put both Mercedes in the S tier? Because I think Hamilton and Russell 
probably should be up there. That I think that was actually quite a pleasant surprise to see Mercedes. I mean, first, I mean, first proper race with their upgrade package in place. I mean, Monaco is a bit of an outlier in terms of tracks. It's not like most circuits. First time at a proper track. Everybody knows Catalonia very, very well. You know, second and third, double podium, big point gain over Aston Martin. I think it's fair to say both Mercedes are at the highest tier for that. Great, great performance all around. Great weekend. Mercedes have done an incredible job. They've been working super hard. Lewis said at the end of the race that, uh, you know, thanking the factory, um, everyone is pushing hard for new pieces, new um, aero packs uh, to arrive. I think they've done a big, big um, evolution development on uh, Barcelona in Barcelona. Mm. And you could see like they're, 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 they've raised up their, their pace. Um, even even uh, Russell was was quick on the medium and the hard compound, uh, very quick actually, quicker than Ferrari, uh, mm. quicker than Paris at some point, very similar to Paris. Yeah, and yeah, definitely, and definitely quicker than Aston. Yes. So it means now Mercedes look like in Barcelona, which at the end of the day Barcelona is like the reference track of the every single track. You know, mm. you want to be, you want to, you want to have a quick car in Barcelona because if you know you have a quick car in Barcelona. Using less the tires and being, you know, efficient, um, you can be quick everywhere. Suzuka, mm, Spa, Silverstone. Good baseline, yeah. So this race is a, I think, a turning point for what can happen for the rest of the races. Yeah. And uh, Mercedes showed incredible, um, an incredible upgrade and an incredible race pace. Even mm. though <laughs> they're still. Finishing the track, the, the race, uh, 19 seconds behind uh, Max. So. It's still a step in the right direction uh, for Mercedes, I would say. So, I mean, especially given, as you mentioned, they're in a key fight for Aston Martin, their own customers, for second in the championship right now. I mean, you, obviously, you're Spanish. We've got to talk about the, the Spanish contingent. Where would you have the Aston Martins with, with, with obviously Fernando, probably his weakest weekend in the Aston Martin so far, and Stroll beat him over the line as well. And you know, Very strong. um, you know, what, what did you make of Aston Martin this weekend? Because that is, is there a cause for concern here, given that Mercedes have just brought their upgrades in and now have, have looked looked a lot quicker this weekend? Formula One is a never stop uh, sport, and I mean never stop because the. There's guys in the factory right now on every team, or at least top teams who are still working and looking for performance for the next race. Mm. There's always something happening in the wind tunnel. There's always something happening on the designed uh, area. Everyone is working hard to get performance. 100%. This is what one is about. And um, Aston Martin has a super inter interesting project. They've built an amazing car. They did... Uh, get some nice upgrades and they did seem to work because every race they were getting a little bit better. That was my concern. It's like, okay, you make a good baseline car, but how about developing through the season? Because the other teams are going to still working. Now Red Bull has a penalty with a wind tunnel. I'm not sure how much is going to affect that, but trust me, it's something that Adrian is must must not be very happy about because of it's always a wind tunnel mm. activity and try new new and do tests and, and try new new um, possibilities and adjustments for for the um, aero thing. Uh, but uh, for Aston, I think this this race was definitely not a positive. Probably the first not positive race of the season. I'd say so. Yeah. There, uh, Fernando had an exit like he went out on the last corner of Q1, and I knew straight away when they were like the mechanics were working on the. We're putting composite and they're trying to stick some um, uh, carbon fiber on the floor that from the beginning you could see that they, they lost some aero and uh, some, some downforce, some aero uh, fluid from, from down there. And you could see that since then his performance and his uh, space was not there at all. Yeah. Uh, not quick in qualifying and he went in the race and they were just not there. Uh, Lance was quicker than Fernando all over the race. Maybe the last team they were a bit more equal, but mm, they were they were they were slow. They no, were they... definitely slower than Mercedes. Yeah. Very slower. Uh, Alpine and and actually, and actually Sunoda had a little similar pace to them. I'd say so. so yeah. Big downgrade for Aston Martin. Uh, I don't know what's gonna happen. Let's see because I I was surprised. 
I didn't expect that when we were talking about the second quickest car out there. They were quicker than Mercedes. They were quicker than Mercedes, and they were quicker than um, Ferrari just two weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. So, strange stuff. Yeah. What did you What did you make of Carlos Sainz um, and, and, and how he how he got on? I mean, he fell a little bit to fifth in the end. Is this just as good as Ferrari can get? Because obviously Leclerc had a Leclerc was pretty bad. He was outside of the points even. It was a pretty poor weekend for him across the board. Signs at least qualified well, got on the front row, but ended up falling to fifth in the actual race. I mean, what did you make of the Ferrari's weekend? Honestly, I feel I know I'm really objective with my words and <laughs> I mean, what I think. Probably mm. I didn't go any further in Formula One for that. But um, I'm a very straightforward uh, guy. I don't think Ferrari is a good team. Really. <laughs> no, <laughs> honestly, like you have to see at the, at the numbers. Mm. You are, you know, you're you're playing Champions League, man. You're Manchester City, Paris, or Barcelona. You have to win. Like you're delivered to win. Oh yeah. You have all the budget and all resources, infrastructure in the world. Um, money wise, same. You have all the history. You are forced to win. It's been since 2008 they, they haven't won a world championship. And I'm not saying just not because they don't have a winning car. They had the best car last year for the six, seven first races. And they mm. threw, they, they gave the, the championship to Red Bull because they they kept on having um, reliability. Yeah, reliability uh, issues. Problems with the engines and doing crazy stuff with strategies. So you don't have the, the right human team and you can see. I'm so, nobody to say that, but I, you know, at the end, I have nothing to lose, and I see it from the outside. You know, all the teams are being efficient and doing a great job with less. Mm, absolutely, it's just about doing that. It's, uh, Formula One is not just about throwing a bunch of money in. You know, yeah, you've seen it in the past with Honda, Toyota. Absolutely, yeah, it's, definitely. It's with a lot of budget, just putting money and investing money, and and being no efficient, being no, you know, with with no results, no, no, not de delivering well. So, and this is what's happening right now in Ferrari. I think they have very two very good drivers. Carlos yeah, they... drove, drove a very smart weekend. Mm -hmm. He understood, and I talked to him yesterday and uh, with the tires situation because this is what I was talking to you about. We've oh, yeah. seen a strange and weird qualifying session because it, it was all about understanding the working ranges of the tires. Uh, yes. Carlos, Carlos got all all their sets, all his sets on the window on the yeah. right. Window. Uh, Charles didn't manage to do that. Checo didn't manage to do that. Magnussen didn't manage to do that. Russell didn't manage to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. We see we see this different um um difference in performance. But all in all, uh today they just lack pace. I mean they have a good car, of course. It's not a shit car. But um but 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 they but they were definitely they couldn't compete against Mercedes, both of them. No yeah. way. Absolutely. So I think that was drove a good race. He yep. did what he did. He didn't have anything left. And it's a solid fifth place at the end, which is what it is. It's the maximum Ferrari can get at the moment. Yeah, I, I think so. I think they're the fourth best team in F1 right now. I think they're behind Mercedes and Aston Martin at the moment. So actually, I think fifth isn't too bad for Carlos Sainz over the course of the weekend. Charles struggling to 11th place even I know he had to start from pit lane but he actually had a chance to rebuild the car and change the setup and it was still he was still losing yeah. out to Pierre Gasly that's that's just not good enough no, no, no I mean the race pace was not there at all no, definitely not definitely not I know you mentioned him earlier I'm, I'm going to put Joe up there in the S tier as well because I think Joe Guan Yu finishing ninth in the Alfa Romeo I think that's a very good weekend for him especially given Valtteri Bottas was right at the back of the field he really struggled out there in terms of tyre wear and I know they weren't particularly good on the softs but on their other stints I actually thought that the Alfa Romeo didn't look half bad and I think Joe drove very well yeah I think so too I mean he's showing some you know some sparks of good performances mm. at some Alfa Romeo is not a bad car at all and uh, you can see I think they're bringing upgrades upgrades as well they're you know getting a bit more uh, pace through the year as the year goes by and Zul drove a good race today I think he did a good job he deal well with the tires he used them uh, pr properly it was not an easy race you know especially Barcelona is a track where the uh, tire wear is, is quite high um, on the conditions they drove because there was no grip at the beginning because we are coming from a very uncertain qualifying with the, you know, different conditions on the weather. So 
you know, I think I think Zo has to be has to be happy. Ah, I say so. Team, and uh, this is sometimes feeling like a victory when you don't really <laughs> have the tools to fight for the big dogs, you know. Especially when the bottom half of the field are going to struggle to fight for points because there are five clearly distinctly better teams than them at the moment. So points there are no gonna... there were there were no retirements today. No, like, or no everybody finished. Happened. Yeah, uh, everyone finished. So races like that count double. Absolutely, all performances of every single car, every driver. You have a clear picture of every driver um, race pace, so you can see clearly where you are. You know? I, I agree with you on that one. Quick break for our sponsors at, uh, at Haas and, uh, and MoneyGram because they have their Send of the Day nomination for the best overtaker of the, of the race. I am certainly going to give that one, and we'll talk about Alpine in a minute as well, to, to Pierre Gasly. I think Gasly's outside pass through turn one on Nick DeFries I thought was a very, very nice move. Um, you, you know, you, you talked a lot about making the outside line work. I think I think Gasly definitely made that one work through turn one. So that's my nomination for send of the day. Um, definitely was a big fan of that overtake. We didn't have too many ones that were outstanding, but I also liked Stroll's one on Hamilton at the early start of the race. I thought that was a pretty nice lap one move from Lance. So I'm going to nominate Pierre Gasly. Um, um, on um, on Nick DeFries as my MoneyGram send of the day. Shout out to those guys as ever. Um, back to the tier list. I mean, what what did you make of Alpine? Because I mean, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of back and forth talk about Alpine. You know, their bosses of you know Lauren Rossi, the CEO, has been very critical of of the team and saying that they've been unacceptable so far. It looks like they're back in contention for me for that like third and fourth sort of running at the moment. I think Gasly didn't do himself any favors in qualifying with two pretty blatant blocks. I mean, do you think they were they were both penalties? I mean, I think they were both pretty clear blocks to me. Gasly drove stupidly in qualifying. He mm. cannot block this way and block other drivers. This has to be penalized, and I think it was definitely a well deserved penalty for for Gasly. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think the team look a little bit better, I'd say, over the last couple of hours. I mean, obviously, Ocon was brilliant in Monaco to get that podium finish in third. And he was seven, he was eighth again here. I think that's a pretty good weekend for Arpin. They look a bit closer to some of the other guys they should be fighting against, like like Aston Martin and Ferrari. I think they, they're, they're trending in the right direction. I think so. I think that gap is very close between Ferrari, Aston and uh, themselves, Alpine. Um, it is very close, so that window can be bigger or reduced depending on what the teams do from now on. But uh, it's an interesting window, actually, because mm. you know you find all fifth, fifth, sixth place in the constructors. And uh, honestly, I do believe Ferrari and Aston Martin have more potential to upgrade the car than not Alpine. It's basically on their history, based on their history. But um, it was interesting to see Ocon that the race pace was was there, you know, was was enough to be in the top ten, you know, enough to mm. maybe not as good as Stroll's one, but nearby. Yeah. So let's see how they do. I mean, it's difficult. It is, you know, it's always difficult to see because you're looking in the race at many information. Mm. And sometimes when you look at the first part of the race and, you know, the first positions, then you you don't have a clear picture of what's happening <laughs> in the back with race strategies and paces and so on. Absolutely. Um, what about McLaren? Now, this is an interesting one because Lando Norris was was outstanding in qualifying, qualified yeah. third, um, genuine shock, real surprise. Um, I think he was excellent in qualifying but then his race lasted about 15 seconds he drove into the side of hamilton's car and that pretty much ruined his entire grand prix um and you know piastri was okay only 13th mclaren just don't look like a very just don't look like a very competitive team at the moment even even when everything is running properly i think piastri is a great talent i don't know how you feel about him but mclaren yeah, just don't look good at the moment both great drivers at the end and of course you know top teams are employing good drivers for sure no doubt about it. Um, they managed to uh, to put the tires on the on the right working range on qualifying. For some reason, McLaren looks like a car where it seems easy to get the tires into temperature, into the right working range, and that's yeah. the reason why they could manage to do good lap times in in Q three. Absolutely, uh, it is surprising, of course, because you don't 
think McLaren has a car to be that good in Q3, mm. and then you see, and then and then you see the real handicap. Let's say uh, you you see the, the the situation, you know, the reality on the race. Uh, they struggle with tires. They overheat the tires. They mm. use them and the rest. They degrade more the tires, so they so that's why they they back. Same with uh, same situation with uh, Haas, with uh, Hulkenberg. Uh, they understood very well on how to use the tires for one lap. They they you know they hit the numbers on the on the one lap. They were operating on the right window, right temperature window of the right compound, but then after a few laps. The car is the car, and you see that you cannot contain this uh, pace, and you go, you go slower. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's look at Haas. <laughs> this, uh, I mean, it seems to me, and I get the impression. I, I've got Magnussen down in D for 18th, and I got Hulkenberg C for 15th. They've got a great car over one lap. I mean, Hulkenberg has qualified really well all year long. He was set. He started seventh in this race. Um, but he fell through the field so quickly. It looks to me as if Haas are, are, some, are becoming like one lap specialists. I think Hulkenberg really does qualify very well right now since coming back. But in race trim, Haas look like they're still struggling to really get into the fight for points. I don't know how you feel about him. Yeah, I mean, I just want to say something. Mm. Yeah, Hulkenberg is not just a fast driver. He's a very experienced driver. He mm. knows for very well. Unfortunately, he didn't have. He never had a competitive car in order to show everyone that he can win a world championship. Because mm. I do, I do feel he he's a he's a champion. He's always shown on junior categories. Absolutely, and Le Mans. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So um, for me, uh, it's not just a question of being quick in qualifying. It's a question of, that he's a smart driver. He understood well on how to use these tires. He mm. took the maximum out of it. It was a weird situation on qualifying it started kind of funny rainy conditions let's say uh with a few spots uh, with a few wet spots uh people were struggling with grip they were doing mistakes so mm. it was you know an up and down session yeah. he, was, he was showing straight away from the beginning even in fp3 yeah. he got these super soft tires super, these soft tires to work and was already on the first outlap straight and fast and quick mm. so at the end, the race pace is the race pace, so you cannot really hide. No, uh, absolutely not. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, of course, everyone was going to expect that Nico was going to fall back. And that's the real position. The yeah. other thing, is because they do a better job as a team and as a driver in qualifying to get these tires to work. But the car is the car. I mean, their downforce levels and their, uh, you know, consolidation as a team is where they should be because it's not a big team. Question from Miguel in the chat. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, we're talking about the other side of the Haas garage real quick. Do you think, as he, ask, he asks you, Jaime, he says, Jaime, could Magnussen be at risk of losing his seat? In Formula One, you never know because, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you can be at risk or in one race and then the other race, you are fine. Uh, I've seen so many different, you know, especially with what happened to me, mm. that we, we end up the season doing, I think, a very good job at the end with me and my teammate. And we presented the car here in Madrid, actually. And then one day later, I was out of Formula One, all of a sudden, like that, in one minute call. So Formula One is crazy. Like, you don't know what's going to happen with... Uh, even, even if you do a good job, even if you're doing great results, even if you're, if you're showing you're delivering... Just don't know, man. Yes, many factors going around, and teams sometimes struggling with money. I'm not sure. I mean, I I don't really follow the. I don't go to races. I don't know how it's the driver situation, driver mm. market at the moment. But I know the cost cap probably has been beneficial for Formula Ones. They have a little bit more mar margin. I'd say so. It looks like uh, sponsorships have been growing up. Uh, there's much more momentum in Formula One, better audiences. So this is always helping the sport. But um, at the end of the day, you know, the Formula One team nowadays is a huge company and they have to survive. They have to pay salaries, rent. Uh, you know, it's a huge, uh, you know, like a huge company that has to work out. And drivers um, are part of, of this company, sometimes are employees. 
Mm -hmm. um, our clients. So <laughs> absolutely, you never know. You never know. Um, that'll just about do it for the WTF on Rap Power by MoneyGram. Um, thanks to everyone on YouTube for joining along and chipping in. Big debate in the comment about whether Verstappen should be an S or not. A Grand Slam is absolutely worth something. It is total domination. You get an extra point for fastest lap. I, I am far, I am not moving Max out of S, chat. So I'm, you're not getting this one. Absolutely not. But uh, Jaime, before we get out of here, tell the good people where they can find you on social media if they want to get to know you a little bit better. I know you're a very keen DJ these days. Um, you've you've transitioned to that, 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 that next chapter of your life. So uh, give, promote yourself. Give, give, give a couple of minutes. Just no, tell, no, tell the good people where they can find you. <laughs> I'm, uh, I've been very lucky to do um, things that I've been loving in my life. One mm -hmm. of them was racing through a long period of my life. And now it's music. Absolutely. Since, uh, for a while. I make music as Squire, which is my alias. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can type it on Spotify, Squire. You will find me out. That's my music. I produce music every day uh, for 10 hours a day in my studio. I love making music. Creating art is something really special. And obviously, you know, mixing records, playing out stuff uh, in, in festivals, concerts, and clubs all around the world. It's also part of the job. It's great. It's fun. It's something that you give to people and um, Absolutely. You, people, you know, you get to know new people and new communities. Very interesting. And uh, yeah, that's my life. That's what I do. I really enjoy it since I've uh, retired from my racing life. Yeah. 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 yeah brilliant please give him a wtf one bump from all of us here um check him out check Jaime out at squire music huge pleasure to have him on the show um i've been dre harris i hope you guys enjoyed the spanish grand prix and i hope you guys have enjoyed the wtf one rap powered by moneygram we'll be back in a couple of weeks time for the canadian grand prix um on june 18th one of my favorites actually I really can't wait for that one um so yeah looking forward to that thank you all very much for watching i've been dre he's been Jaime. until next time Thanks for watching. Sayonara. Take care.